climate change is the world's biggest health and security issue. The world security issue and health issue. Water security and preservation, as we pointed out, fossil fuel exploration destroys water supplies. Um, fracking wastes. There was a blog on uh, LinkedIn the other day, about a month ago, that about the 30 trillion gallons of toxic fracking chemicals pumped into the earth today. No, they aren't all fracking chemicals. Those are, those, are, those are chemicals and, 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 and insertions that can be put in the earth under current law. It doesn't include fracking chemicals. But you've heard uh, here that every well and every fracking takes about 1.3 million gallons of, of water with those chemicals. And you think of all the fracking wells around the country, we can easily reach 30, 30 trillion gallons of fracking fluids pretty quickly in this country. But who knows what 30 trillion gallons is? It's one-fourth the volume of Lake Erie. If you take those 30 trillion gallons, gallons and put them in Massachusetts, we would have a depth of, uh, of that stuff 14 and a half feet high. It's as big as the state of Delaware. It's twice the size of the state of Rhode Island. That's the volumes we're talking about. And with fracking fluids, we're going to be doubling that not too far, not too, not too soon from now. <clears throat> now, another public policy is jobs. Natural gas has few jobs. You put in a pipeline, you've got a temporary construction crew, and then you need very few people to operate it, but you have people running the, the gas plants, but they have very few employees either. So where are the jobs? Clean energy, renewable energy, and those are local jobs. Those are jobs that we, for example, in Massachusetts, we buy all our energy. We export dollars to buy our energy. Every time you put a solar panel on a house, that's a local job. Someone's got to install it here. And you can have local manufacturers. You have local, you've got frame manufacturers all over New England to build those frames that you put the solar panels in. You've got unionized uh, and expert electricians to install that uh, material. So those are local jobs. Once you install a gas pipeline, there are no jobs created thereafter. It's it. You turn a stopcock, and that's it. Public health. Natural gas, of course, is cleaner than coal, but not as clean as renewables. So, I want to get to solutions. We can spend $4 billion on new pipelines coming from through Connecticut. And by the way, Connecticut is becoming more devoted to gas every day. From New York or down from Canada. An investment in a pipeline is a 60-year investment. So once that pipeline goes in, we're stuck with that for 60 years. Who's <coughs> going to go ahead and cut the life of a 60-year investment after 10 years? So where do we put that investment? If you put $4 billion into renewable and clean energy, you get a much better longer-term bang for the buck than you do by putting in the pipeline. And you have the greenhouse gas effect reducing that. But the real issue is how do we heat our homes? We hit our homes with oil and gas. So what do we have to replace it? You aren't going to get rid of gas being piped in until we find another way to heat our homes. And there are technologies available. And we have energy efficiency, first line of defense. Reduce your home energy needs for your home by 30% by insulating, etc. Key to becoming key to this issue. You've got fuel cells, new technology. There are some fuel cells around in remote areas, graphite, air, hydrogen fuel cells. Not very practical right now. You've got passive solar um, and other passive techniques to collect heat from the sun, and that works in certain circumstances. But you also have something called heat pumps. Now you've got air source heat pumps, which Next Step Living others, Mitsubishi and Toshiba, uh, put out there in the market. But you've also got ground loop heat pumps. And right now, there's a company in Waltham, run by a woman, a uh, PhD, uh, and she's put in 150 retrofit vertical heat pumps in eastern Massachusetts in the last several years. So someone's made the economic decision that those are viable. So the question is, do we go ahead and try to do things like heat pumps? And what's a heat pump cost? 
eighteen, twenty thousand dollars for a home. That's not much different than putting on a solar panel that is, gives you intermittent energy for uh, a period of time with net metering. Uh, you can cost uh, the, that solar panel is four bucks, four to six bucks, about six bucks a watt right now on a, on a home. So if you need two thousand watt system, that's twelve thousand dollars, not including the money that you spend for reinforcing your roof or doing other retrofit to make sure it happens. You get tax credits for each. For solar, you get solar renewable energy credits. But and there's a bill before the legislature right now to, to have thermal energy credits also for heat pumps. There are also thermal energy credits for solar right now, but not for heat pumps. There's a bill before the legislature right now to have that happen. So we need support for that bill. That's one thing you can do. Um, so we make the economics work right now with tax policy. The utilities already are used to the fact that they should go ahead and support these renewables to avoid the cost of a new plant, and we've got rebates. And you've got savings from your standpoint. But the key is, you around this table have to make the decision to do this. It's not going to happen unless you look at it as a viable market alternative to what you're doing. In Massachusetts, most home heating systems are probably 12 years old. So it's time to replace them. So look at the cost advantages, and whether you're motivated by economics or being green or social justice, whatever, now's the time to do it. So I'm looking for market-based solutions. So I'm going to do a little demonstration here as to what a market-based solution is. This is a gas pipeline coming into the state. And there are a bunch of subsidiary pipelines, and then there are a bunch of other subsidiary pipelines, and a bunch of other, and a bunch of other, until you hit a thousand homes. You've got a thousand fingers out there. At the end of every finger, at the end, is a home. Let's suppose, and you can go ahead and give me the answer to this, and you can give me the answer to this too. It costs a certain amount of money to put in a pipeline. And let's suppose you put in a pipeline for a thousand homes. I don't know what that costs. But I don't need to know what that costs, because if you go ahead and have a thousand homes and you convert 10% of them to a heat pump, you've taken away 10% of the customer. That's the hundred customers taken away from the <coughs> gas pipeline. And those customers won't have, they'll have, they'll, they'll be using more gas than anyone else because the big users, the bigger houses, will be the first to convert. They're, they're more able to do that. So you might have an impact on 15 to 20% of the market. So this is kind of a guerrilla tactic. But if you take away the market and increase the, decrease the number of houses that you have to, for, the, for the recovery of capital expenses, you'll all of a sudden raise the price of natural gas and lower the price of something like a heat pump. So think about that as, a, as an alternative. So you're, and also, what's going to happen to the price of natural gas? You advert it to it. And we got, what, two or three ports now approved to produce LNG and export it around the world. Two years ago, natural gas, frac gas, cost two bucks a thousand BTU. Today, it's four bucks a thousand BTU. In Europe, it's fourteen dollars a thousand BTU. In Japan, it's eighteen dollars a thousand BTU. It costs three dollars a thousand BTU to ship it, and a certain number of other dollars to go ahead and make it into LNG. Now, are we going to get more export opportunities? Yes. Australia and Shell right now are working on an offshore floating LNG converter. So you don't have to get a permit to go ahead and put one on land. You have a floating one out at sea. And those pipelines are already out there because those are the pipelines that brought gas into this country. There's one off Massachusetts. There are a whole bunch around the country. So you just reverse the pipeline flow. It's what Dominion Energy saw as an opportunity. That's why they put in Chenier and the, the Delaware plan. They are reversing the flow of pipelines to export natural gas because they looked at it and said this is an opportunity to go ahead and do this. But you're not going to necessarily have to have a, 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 a shore facility. You'll have a ship out there that will convert that gas into a liquid form, freeze it, and put it into the tanker to ship around. Now, what will happen then? Well. If I can sell my gas for $14 a million, a thousand BTU in Europe, and it only costs me $3 to ship it, another $2 to go ahead and convert it to LNG, my profit is much higher than if I sold it in Massachusetts. 
So that's where it's going to go, and the price here is going to rise. So natural gas is not the solution. And you combine that cost with the carbon equation we gave you earlier, where you might save 50% of the CO2 emissions by using natural gas, but a very small amount of leakage of natural gas will go ahead and make up the difference very quickly. Then we see that the solution is we've got to put natural gas not out of business. It's always going to have some role somewhere. You're always going to have a grid, a smart grid that will have a turbine there that will be able to come on in 10 minutes because uh, the sun went down or the wind stopped blowing or that equation is going to be there, but it's not going to be the volume we have now.